Okay, welcome everybody uh, in the seminar room and online. Let me do it like this, very nice. Uh, it is a pleasure to have with us. Uh, okay, like this. It is a pleasure to have with us uh, Eugene Vasiliev. Uh, those of you who are working in uh, dynamics uh, know him already. Let me say uh, just a few words for the rest. Eugene is a known specialist in galactic dynamics. He's known uh, for a series of very interesting papers and algorithms that he develops. Uh, he got his PhD in, in Moscow, in the Lebedev Physical Institute. And then there is a, a series of uh, postdoc positions, essentially, in Marseille, in Rochester, in the US. In the US. Uh, Oxford, Cambridge, and uh, since a uh, few months now he's in Surrey, where he continues his uh, successful career. Uh, you have already received the announcement. Uh, you see the title also in the screen, Dynamical Modeling of Bulk Galaxies. And uh, Eugene, you can start. Thank you for accepting our invitation and being with us. We are looking forward for your talk. Thank you. Yes, I'm uh, happy to uh, talk at uh, the Academy of Athens again, uh, even virtually. Hope that I'll be able to visit you one day again. Okay. And uh, today I'm going to talk about the dynamical modeling of barred galaxies. Uh, but, uh, to start with, let me just uh, present some motivation. Uh, why do we uh, care about barred galaxies? The reason is simply because they're quite numerous in the universe. Of course, the Milky Way is a barred galaxy and uh, perhaps uh, a half of or even maybe more than a half of all spiral galaxies, uh, you know, at least in the local universe, have some sort of bars. And uh, the questions that we want to learn from the modeling of these systems are numerous, and in particular, the formation mechanisms of the bars, their current state, uh, uh, the interplay between the bars and supermassive black holes is a very interesting topic. And uh, of course, if you uh, want to infer anything about the mass distribution of uh, the galaxy, we do need to run some sort of dynamical models. And uh, doing it with barred galaxies is complicated because of geometry, because of these extra parameters, the pattern speed of the bar, and so on. But uh, one of the uh, most uh, significant problems that appears even before uh, you do any sort of dynamical modeling is how to infer the three-dimensional shape of a galaxy from its projected image, or in other words, the problem of the projection. And I'm going to talk about uh, various approaches and various pitfalls and the possible path forward. And then I'll continue to talk about um, the dynamical modeling proper, the methods for inferring the pattern speed of bars and the, the mass distribution of our galaxies, and present some pre preliminary tests of uh, the new methods that we are uh, developing. So let me start with the question of uh, the projection. The problem is essentially that uh, we have galaxies on the sky as two-dimensional images, and we want to get some idea about their three-dimensional shapes. And um, as you could imagine, uh, this procedure is highly non-unique. Depending on the three-dimensional shape of the galaxy, you might be able to measure some properties, or maybe not. And uh, to illustrate it, let me uh, start with some mathematical uh, formalism that um, helps to uh, shed the light on uh, this problem. There is a non-uniqueness of the degeneracy of the projection has been known since uh, several decades ago. And uh, it rests on this interesting mathematical result known as the Fourier slice theorem. Mm -hmm. So uh, let me um, uh, try to illustrate it here for the case of axisymmetric systems, which are of course simpler than Bar galaxies, but uh, even those systems have some uh, degeneracies in the D projection. When you observe a system from a given angle, from uh, the line of sight inclination angle, is uh, the angle between the uh, line of sight and the uh, minor axis of the galaxy. So the inclination angle of zero is that you see the galaxy face on, uh, 90 degrees, you see it edge on. And uh, essentially, when you uh, look at uh, the projected image, the surface density profile informs you about uh, the Fourier transform of the density uh, in the slice of um, 
perpendicular to the line of sight. <clears throat> now, uh, of course, that's not uh, the whole density of the systems. In order to infer the three-dimensional density, you would need to get the uh, Fourier transform of the density in the entire three-dimensional space. For uh, axisymmetric galaxies, though, the plane that you have the measurements can be rotated along, uh, sorry, can be rotated around this symmetry axis by any angle because the galaxy is axisymmetric. So if you imagine this plane to be rotating uh, around the, the symmetry axis, you get uh, some sort of a cone. And uh, the entire space outside this cone is also filled by different orientations of the same plane. So essentially, you have information not only on one plane, but you have an information in the three dimensional Fourier space everywhere except inside the cone. But inside this cone, uh, the rotation of this plane doesn't cover this region of space. So we have no information about uh, the Fourier transform of the density profile in this region. And therefore, um, in the, the projected image, basically anything that is hidden in this region of the Fourier space will not be visible at all. And uh, in uh, uh, practical terms, that means that um, uh, you could imagine a certain combination of uh, positive and negative contribution to, to the density profile that would be completely invisible. These uh, families of uh, density components are known as conus density. And they share the property that they would be invisible at any inclination uh, smaller than a certain angle. So, of course, the, in order to project to, to zero, it, it has to be positive and negative. So this alone cannot be a single density component. But if you add this to a positive density, you might have something like this. So um, um, yes, so uh, this positive and negative density added to a normal uh, axisymmetric uh, ellipsoidal density could produce density with a boxy shape, or if you add it to a negative sign, it could produce density with more like uh, X-shaped features. And uh, in both cases, you would not be able to see it if you observe it in projection uh, closer to face-on orientation. So. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, OK. So once again, uh, if you look at uh, the galaxy face on, this extra density component would be averaging to zero. And only if you see it close to edge on, you would start to see that actually it has some positive and negative parts. But uh, it uh, vanishes for, in this example, for all, all inclinations smaller than 45 degrees. And uh, basically, it means that um, if uh, the galaxy is close to face on, you have very little information about uh, its density along the line of sight, which is quite sensible from everyday perspective. You don't know if the galaxy is very flat or very thick, or if, if it has some fluctuations, well, some wiggles uh, along the line of sight that uh, basically average out to zero. And uh, this problem exists already in axisymmetric systems. And in interaxial systems, the situation is much, much worse. Basically, you have the constraints about uh, the Fourier transform of your system only in uh, some small part of the Fourier space. And uh, the projection, therefore, is highly non-unique for traxial systems, which, of course, includes the bars. The question is, uh, if we cannot infer the shape only from the photometry, uh, what could be the next steps? One of the possible ways forward, which I will discuss later in the talk, is to add the climatic information that should help to distinguish between uh, galaxies that are have different intrinsic shapes. But in order to use this kinematic information, we still need to uh, somehow explore all possible shapes uh, of or the projection of a given galaxy that are consistent with the photometric image. And uh, why don't people just uh, run around in circles uh, in despair, uh, given this high, highly non-unique uh, the projection because uh, there is a very special case which is very fortunate to have unique the projection and this case is what almost uh, all uh, studies are using in practice and uh, uh, this is uh, if the if you assume that the density is stratified on ellipsoidal uh, equidensity density surfaces 
then indeed for any assumed inclination you can infer the density three-dimensional density in a unique way um, so imagine that um, a galaxy is a perfectly ellipsoidal shape and you observe it on the sky in somewhat flattened way so the three-dimensional shape of the galaxy depends on the inclination and if you see it exactly edge on you would basically see that the galaxy is kind of uh, relatively fat if you start to make the inclination angle smaller closer to uh, face on, the intrinsic shape has to be thinner and thinner in order to, for the projected image to become to, to stay the same until uh, you hit the critical minimal inclination below which the, the projection is impossible. So if the galaxy is entirely round, it could be deprojected at all inclinations. If it is flattened, then there is a minimum inclination. But uh, for any inclination above this minimum, uh, there is only one three-dimensional density assuming that it is ellipsoidal. And uh, that uh, simplicity is why people use these assumptions widely in practice. You don't have to assume that the galaxy has the same shape at all radii, but you can compose it uh, from several from a superposition of several ellipsoidal components. And uh, in this case, uh, each of the components can be deprojected into a unique three-dimensional shape and you're fine. But this is, uh, once again, only one possible assumption. And if the galaxy is not composed of concentric ellipsoids, then uh, you only get one solution, but you don't explore all the entire space of possible solutions. So in principle, there are uh, approaches for inferring the shape. They fall into two broad categories. Parametric, uh, where you choose a certain functional form for the density, and uh, under certain assumptions about the viewing angles, the inclination and orientation of the galaxy, you can infer the shape. <clears throat> or uh, you could try to do uh, something uh, non-parametric or rather multi-parametric where uh, your uh, three-dimensional model has a lot of free parameters and then explore the shape. There will be a lot of degeneracies in this spa space of parameters, but at least uh, you should be able to cope with them imposing some sensible priors. And uh, in both cases, so the uh, idea would be that uh, you don't get just one solution, but you should get a family of, of, or range of possible solutions. Uh, the additional complications for photometric fitting is that the sky is not, doesn't just contain your galaxy. It might contain some foreground stars. It might be some dust lanes in the galaxy that you want to ignore. So in short, you want to represent uh, the system in as simple way as possible. Uh, here, it's not even the simplest. I guess the simplest uh, the projection of these ways would be, like, I don't know, like a sphere, ellipsoid. But um, um, you can add some wiggles and handles if you need. Uh, for this photometric fitting, uh, there are several widely used packages. Uh, one is, I already mentioned, the assumption of ellipsoidal systems leads very naturally to uh, using a superposition of Gaussians as a uh, your basis and the superposition of Gaussians kind of falls into more or less non-parametric category because you can add as many of them as possible. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in practice, you, you would do maybe five, 10 Gaussians. Uh, each of them might have different shape, but uh, together they should represent the galaxy, even in some twists and wiggles. Uh, but again, this assumption relies on, uh, uh, this method relies on the assumption of uh, uh, intrinsically ellipsoidal components. Um, uh, other codes that uh, deal with the photometric uh, fitting are GALFIT, uh, which again is a two-dimensional fitting code. It has a larger variety of uh, models, which might include some boxy shapes or some mm, th things that are not ellipsoidal, and IMFIT, um, uh, which, uh, unlike uh, the other two codes, can actually deal with three-dimensional models, which are projected in, on two-dimensional images on the fly. And uh, that feature is uh, actually quite useful for uh, modeling the systems which are not ellipsoid. Because again, uh, for ellipsoidal shapes, once you fit the surface brightness with the superposition of several ellipsoids, each of them can be deprojected in, in a unique way. But if you fit the surface brightness with something that is a box, then you're in trouble because you don't know how to deproject the box. However, if your model is performed in three-dimensional intrinsic space, rather than projected space. 
then you are doing forward modeling all the way from uh, physical grounds. You put in the components that have some physical, physically motivated uh, three-dimensional shapes. You project them on the sky, and then you adjust the parameters until the uh, resulting image ma matches the photometry. But now you not only have the match for the image, but you also have the three-dimensional shape uh, provided by the model. And this crucial feature is important for bars because bars indeed are quite complicated. They are certainly not ellipsoids. And uh, the reason uh, for the shape of the bar to be complicated is linked to their orbital structure. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it, but um, uh, at least a thing that uh, people should know is that bars are composed of resonantly trapped orbits. And uh, these resonantly trapped orbits might have different properties, but uh, one of the most uh, uh, common ones is the uh, fact that uh, the orbits have like a banana shape uh, in a vertical direction. So instead of, so uh, this is a series of images uh, from, a, I think, an antibody simulation of a bar as, as it develops with time and uh, it grows with in size and it also buckles. So the uh, edge on projection of the bar, this is the major axis and this is the minor axis perpendicular to the plane of the disk. In this uh, projection, the bar looks like a peanut. And uh, the reason is because there are a lot of orbits that look like bananas uh, flipped in, uh, uh, in this and this way, and their uh, edges are kind of protruding above the plane. And also, uh, the shape of the bar in uh, even in the face on orientation is also not just an ellipsoid, but there might be protrusions that are also linked to these uh, uh, rather long and thin components of the bar. So this central part is more uh, vertically thick, and it has this uh, often uh, has this uh, uh, peanut shape, but the longer part of the bar is more vertically thin and it's composed of different types of orbits. And uh, that is all to say that uh, as, assuming that the bar is ellipsoid is perhaps an oversimplification. So uh, if we uh, assume instead that the bars follow some plausible parametric uh, families that include the possibility of uh, X shape in the XZ projection and include the possibility of a long bar in the XY plane, then we can try to model it. Uh, and uh, uh, here I'm starting to describe the research uh, uh, done by Shashank Datatri and uh, Monica Valuri, my collaborators, uh, which is based on uh, the photometric fitting code um, IMFIT. And I noticed that Peter is actually uh, following this presentation. So the, the code that uh, Peter Ehrlich has developed which as I said is uh, unique in the sense that it can, it, it can, it can include the three-dimensional structures. So in order to fit the bar shapes here, we implemented, um, uh, Shashank implemented the, the extra family of three-dimensional models, which are tailored to reproduce bars in, in body simulations and also in the real galaxies. So it has a bunch of three parameters. The most important of them would be the distance between the kind of tips of this X-shaped feature the amplitude of the X-shaped feature, uh, you can make it uh, almost ellipsoid or you can make it very prominent. Um, the size and the length of the bar and uh, all of the three parameters could be adjusted to match the observations. And uh, in order to uh, illustrate that this method actually works, we have chosen to uh, work in a rather restricted case. Uh, for the first experiments, we looked at uh, only at edge on projection of galaxies. So here is an example of an n-body snapshot from a simulation of a barred galaxy, where in the face-on orientation, you have like normal bar with a little bit of protrusion of a long and thin bar. And in the edge-on view, you see this uh, X-shaped structure. And uh, uh, if you project it on the sky, you also have a freedom of or orienting uh, the bar major axis with respect to the line of sight. So here is the edge-on view when you the major axis is completely in the sky plane, but you can start to rotate it. And uh, the line of sight with respect to the minor axis of the bar is parameterized by this angle of psi. So psi equal to zero to produce this image. The psi equals to 90 degrees would produce the image of the bar and on. So you would see the bar essentially along the line of sight. And uh, uh, by doing this uh, fitting, uh, we were able to recover the shape of the bar reasonably well, as long as the bar is reasonably uh, not, not not too much end on, because <clears throat> so here, uh, 
Uh, here is an example of the same simulation, but now with the um, model reproducing the properties of the bar. Again, you don't see it uh, in the face-on view. We only see it edge-on. So this is the image that they put in into this fitting code. And uh, this is the model that it recovers. So this is for 45 degree inclination, sorry, 90 degree inclination, 45 degree rotation of the bar in, the, in this plane. You still see X-shaped features very well. Of course, if you now put the line of sight at 90 degrees, uh, you would see the bar essentially down the barrel and these X-shaped features would disappear because they would be put on top of each other. So in this case, you would not be able to infer the presence of the X-shaped features. You might see something that is just a disk with some protrusion on top of it. <clears throat> so how well can we recover the pattern speed? That depends on this orientation angle. Um, again, uh, if uh, the angle is close to zero, you see the bar along the uh, intermediate axis, so the bar is uh, very long on the sky, you, you can see it very well. But in principle, the same image could be produced by a bar that is longer, but uh, rotated at, let's say, 45 degrees and 50% uh, longer. So what you can, uh, how well can you measure this orientation angle psi? You can certainly uh, uh, exclude the cases where psi is close to 90 degrees because then you would not see uh, the X-shaped feature of the bar. But uh, you cannot exclude the uh, orientations uh, that are between zero and some maximum value that is, uh, let's say, uh, close to the true orientation or even slightly longer. So once again, this, this is because uh, if you start to rotate the bar and simultaneously make it longer, the projected image remains the same. It's only when uh, it is rotated entirely end-on, then this X-shape feature disappears. So in this case, you exclude the uh, end-on orientation, but uh, anything um, between zero and uh, 60 degrees still produces a reasonably shape, x shaped feature. So you are not able to determine the bar properties that well in this region of space. So there is still some degeneracy here. And hopefully, adding kinematical information should help to lift this degeneracy, as we will see in the second part of the talk, that is indeed the case. And uh, that was all about uh, the difficulties of uh, the difficulties and degeneracies in uh, modeling the photometry of bar galaxies. But of course, the interesting part of bar galaxies is not just the photometry, but also the ways that the stars move, the kinematics, and uh, the underlying dynamical uh, state of the system. And uh, the challenges, as I already note, noted, that the geometry of the system is uh, at least triaxial or even maybe sometimes less symmetric. Uh, there are a lot of uh, chaotic orbits in the uh, BART systems, which makes modeling more complicated. And uh, out of the uh, various methods for uh, dealing with dynamical modeling, not all of them are suitable for bar galaxies. Uh, for example, I don't think the genes modeling approaches, which are probably the most common ones, would be able to measure either, either the pattern speed or the potential. Because uh, even though there have been some applications of genes models to track those systems, but uh, none of of them were put into practice. And uh, most of the times they would be restricted to axisymmetric systems, which of course precludes any information about the bar. Uh, models based on distribution functions in principle might be applied to BART systems, but so far there has been no attempt to do that. Uh, however, there are a number of methods that should work with BARs. And uh, uh, one of the most widely used methods for measuring the pattern speed uh, is the method of Tremaine and Weinberg, which I'll describe shortly. Um, this method uh, deals with the kinematics only, so it, it's not a dynamical modeling method, but it's a method for trying to constrain the pattern speed. So it does not provide constraints on the potential, but only on the, on the pattern speed. Uh, then there are uh, various models that are based on you know, so-called response models, where you assume a potential integrate orbits and then uh, look at uh, the resulting features. And then there are methods based on the n-body simulations or on orbit superpositions. So I'll now describe them in, in turn. Uh, starting with the remaining binding method. So this method has been put forward um, already 40 years ago, it's remaining Weinberg. And uh, it stems from a very basic assumption of continuity in the three-dimensional motion of stars in the galaxy. 
uh, but you use it in the projected image only. And uh, here I'm illustrating it uh, with the synthetic image from this paper of uh, Fei Zhou, but uh, of course it has been developed for real galaxies. The idea here is that if you have a two-dimensional image of the galaxy, uh, the galaxy rotates, let's say this way, and uh, it is inclined at some inclination angle. So in principle, in this part of the sky, you would see mostly stars moving away from you. This part would be mostly towards you, maybe vice versa. So you should be able to measure the line side velocity that is has no zero mean and has opposite signs and opposite signs of the galaxy. And uh, you also see that uh, the mean x value is different. So here it's negative, here it's positive. So in principle, there is a relation between the mean x at the given y and the mean velocity, which is expressed by the ratio of these two means. So uh, for each of these uh, slits or pseudo slits, you integrate along the x direction and you get the mean coordinate x uh, and then mean uh, velocity at, at, the given, at the given one. At the given value of y, get the mean value of x and mean uh, line set velocity. And then if you plot them against each other, the slope of this line uh, dimensionally is just a pattern speed. So in principle, if you try to fit all these measurements for different uh, slits at different values of y with a single line, that slope of the line should give you the pattern speed. So conceptually, it's more or less straightforward. It's easy to implement, uh, especially nowadays that we have uh, not just individual slits, as were the case when this method was developed, but we have a full two-dimensional IFU data. You principally can simulate it with different slits and all possible orientations. Uh, the caveats here is that this method works only in the limited range of inclinations. Of course, if the galaxy is face-on, no dynamical modeling method will tell you the pattern speed of the bar because there is nothing along the line of sight that informs you about the pattern speed. But this method also doesn't work when the galaxy is edge on. And that's because both integrals here, uh, they will vanish. So you get the indeterminacy of zero over zero. So basically it works in the range of inclinations that is intermediate, sometimes somewhere between 15 and 60, 70 degrees. And also the orientations of the bar could not be end on or could not be uh, along the minor or major axis of the bar because again, then both integrals vanish. So it works in the limited range of orientations. And also for mathematical consistency, you have to formally integrate uh, these uh, equations from z minus to plus infinity. And uh, when you have only limited view, because all of your instruments on the sky have a limited field of view, uh, you have some boundary effects which should be compensated, although it can be done apparently. So this is the method that tells you about the pattern speed, but it works only looking at the mean line set velocity. It doesn't look at any other kinematic data. And uh, it works in some limited range of circumstances. Next, uh, we have a series of uh, methods or methods that are based on the idea of uh, response models. So here, in a nutshell, they work as follows. Uh, you assume some properties of the galaxy, the potential, the pattern speed, then you construct a series of orbits. And in these methods, you look specifically at uh, periodic orbits in the given potential, periodic or resonant orbits, and populate them in various ways. And then uh, computing the surface density and the kinematics in principle, although most of the time it works just with the surface density, that thing depends on the pattern speed surprisingly, even though you might not have any information about the kinematics, but even the uh, morphological features depend on the pattern speed. For example, the length of the bar tells you somewhat indirectly about the pattern speed. But in order to make it more quantitative, this uh, method is kind of dealing with a full set of orbits, not just uh, looking at the uh, length of the bar, but looks at the uh, other properties. And then they vary the parameters, the potential and the pattern speed until you get good match with kinematics. And this method has been developed by many people, mostly in Greece. That's, of course, you could call it a Greek school. And uh, next, uh, uh, there is a series of methods that are based on the so-called guided and body simulations, or uh, they came to be known as made-to-measure methods. Uh, they were introduced by uh, Sarah and Tremaine, but uh, they were mostly 
well, there are several groups that developed it, but perhaps the most well-known are a group of Orton Gerhard, and for that reason, I would call them a Munich school. And uh, the idea here is that uh, you have an n-body system, which evolves self-consistently, and uh, it evolves in the way it, it wants, but you kind of nudge it towards the properties that you would like to reproduce, the surface density of the galaxy, the kinematics, and so on and so forth. And you do it by uh, changing the particle uh, masses on the fly. So you let them move in the self-consistent gravitational potential, but uh, once in a while, or maybe after several time steps, you slightly change the particle masses, increasing the masses that uh, give the good match to kinematics and decrease them, them otherwise. And uh, by doing it for a long enough time, you should be able to uh, constrain the model uh, that is still alive and body system. So it is completely gravitationally self-consistent. You, you constrain it to match the observed properties of uh, your galaxy reasonably well. And uh, this method has been applied to a bunch of galaxies, notably uh, to the Milky Way, uh, where we have um, probably the only widely known model of the Milky Way's bar uh, due to Mathieu Bartai, and um, to some external galaxies, Andromeda particularly. Uh, the benefits of the method is that it's completely general in principle, uh, but it's also quite costly. And uh, it's hard to uh, get uh, uncertainties on the resulting values because you have one model that fits the data as good as it can, but uh, uh, it's not easy to determine what, what are the uncertainties. And then there is uh, the last method that I describe in more detail, uh, which is uh, called the Schwarzschild's orbit superposition method. It was introduced by Martin Schwarzschild. So it's not the Schwarzschild who um, invented the black holes, but uh, his son, Martin Schwarzschild. And uh, uh, this method is based on the idea that you can compose the system of uh, your galaxy out of a collection of orbits. So it has some resemblance to the previous one, where you compose it as a collection of n-body particles. But here, you're dealing not in individual particles, but uh, in terms of uh, entire orbits. And uh, uh, here, you start with a particular guess of the potential. Uh, then you create the orbits in this um, library of orbits in this potential. And then, uh, much like in the made to measure, you have the freedom to adjust the particle weights. Here, you have the freedom to adjust the weights of individual orbits. And you do it in such a way that their density is reproduced. And then kinematics is also reproduced as much as possible. So uh, this method I will describe in more detail now. And um, yeah, to illustrate it, I, I put it, I don't think it's a portrait, uh, but well, could uh, think of it as an um, uh, analogy because Martin Schwarzschild was uh, uh, one of the people who immigrated from Nazi Germany. Uh, and uh, Max Ernst is yet another painter, one of many who did the same, and I think there is some connection. Now, for uh, the Russian method, I'll try to describe it in slightly more detail. So you have a collection of par uh, orbits in the given potential. They have all possible shapes. They might be boxy, uh, tube orbits, some high order resonant orbits, or even completely chaotic orbits. And uh, uh, they have been integrated in a particular potential. And uh, in order to make the model gravitationally self-consistent, you want to make sure that the sum of all orbits with their weights uh, reproduces the target density as much as possible. So you discretize both the orbits and uh, the target density into a three-dimensional grid. And then what you try to match the, is the contribution of uh, um, all particles weighted with their weights, which you don't know yet. But what you want to make sure is that this linear combination of uh, uh, discretized density of each particle reproduce the discretized density of the model. And then you do the same thing with kinematics. Now, uh, the kinematics is, of course, not just a three-dimensional space, but it's uh, um, largely limited to uh, the observed data cube, where uh, in each field of you on the sky, each pixel or spaxel on the sky, you have a full line of sight distri velocity distribution. So let's say for this uh, region, have perhaps bimodal distribution for this orbit, but unimodal for this orbit. And then the observed distribution also has some properties. And again, by summing up the contribution of all orbits with some adjustable weights, you try to reproduce the properties. And uh, oftentimes, these uh, kinematics would be expressed as a, 
uh, maps of uh, so-called Gauss Hermit moments, which are uh, ways of parametrizing line of sight velocity distributions with Gaussians and deviations from a Gaussian. So the Gaussian basically tells you the position and the thickness of the Gaussian tell you about the mean velocity and the velocity dispersion. And then the higher order Gauss Hermit moments describe the uh, deviations of the line profile from a pure Gaussian. The, asymmetry and uh, the deviation from like being top hat or more uh, triangular hat with the wider wings. So these maps, you, you have them observationally for each pixel on the sky and the model should be able to again reproduce these maps. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, you have a large variety of orbits. Each of them has some contribution to the three-dimensional density and has some contribution to the kinematics and the quantity that you want, don't know, but you want to infer from these models is how the uh, how these different orbits are actually populated. So the weights of the orbits. So this is what you construct uh, uh, from the given potential. And this is the uh, vector of orbital weights, which you uh, try to infer by matching the observed conditions, the mass, masses in three-dimensional grid and the kinematics in the spaxels on the sky. So it's a linear programming system, a linear programming problem where you have the matrix, you have a vector of unknowns, you have right-hand side. The only non-trivial thing is that from physical grounds, you expect the orbits to have non-negative weights. So it's not just a, a linear problem, but it's a linear problem with non-negativity constraints. And in practice, this method works as follows. You start from an assumption about the properties of the system, the gravitational potential, uh, in the case of Bard galaxy, you would include pattern speed. And, uh, you might include some other properties. Uh, then you construct the library of orbits in the given potential, uh, and then solve this uh, uh, constraint optimization problem where you uh, minimize the uh, deviations uh, from the observed kinematics uh, by varying the orbit weights. And it computes uh, how well this model fits the kinematics, and then you get this value of chi-square, and then repeat it many times for different choices of potential, pattern speed, and so on. And each of these models is constructed to be equilibrium, gravitationally self-consistent, but they, uh, only one of them or several of them might be fitting the kinematics well enough. And uh, this method, again, has been around for a while, more than 40 years, and uh, has been developed in various uh, by various groups, and several codes are in quite wide use. In particular, uh, the Nukers code uh, that has been uh, often applied to external galaxies to measure the supermassive black holes, dark matter halos, and so on. Uh, this series of codes are axisymmetric, but uh, more recently there were several codes developed for triaxial geometry, which includes the bars, and uh, a couple of codes actually are able to deal with the bars using the pattern speed. So I'm going to talk mostly about uh, the code that I have been developing myself, uh, but uh, as I mentioned briefly that uh, there is an alternative implementation which also deals with the bars. So going back to the barred galaxies and uh, uh, going back to this uh, way of inferring the three-dimensional shapes using this forward modeling of three-dimensional density. The ingredients that we have now for the Schwarzschild models would be the following. Uh, we have this photometric image of this galaxy, which we uh, fitted with several possible bars, as I've already mentioned before. Uh, from pure photometry, we are not able to constrain all properties of the bars. Uh, in particular, we can make a bar longer, but uh, more uh, rotated along the, the line of sight. And uh, photometry alone cannot distinguish uh, between different orientations that well. But uh, then we want to add kinematics and uh, try to construct a fully dynamically self-consistent model. And we do it for each choice of orientation that are equally compatible with photometry. And hopefully only one of them would be uh, giving the kinematics that is right. So uh, now I'm again continuing to describe this uh, um, first paper that uh, implemented this uh, in practice. But in this first paper, we only tested it on the mock data. So there is no application to real galaxies yet. And uh, again, also mentioning that in this first paper, we 
restricted it to a rather specific orientation that is exactly edge on. So the bar can be only rotated along the um, uh, z-axis uh, and projects along the major axis of the image. So we only have one free parameter here, which, which is the orientation of the bar um, with respect to the uh, line of sight. Uh, and uh, in the more general case, we'll have three possible orientation angles. So the inclination angle, the rotation of the bar in the disk plane, and then the rotation of the image plane itself. But uh, in the limited case of edge on orientation, we only have one free parameter. And uh, to mimic uh, the kinematic data, we choose something that resembles the muse, uh, the one of the best uh, spectroscopic IF integral field instruments known so far. And uh, uh, it has quite a large field of view, about uh, one uh, arc minute across, which at the galaxy, for a galaxy at the distance of a Virgo cluster, 15, 20 megaparsec, uh, covers a significant fraction of a bar. Doesn't cover the whole galaxy, but that's typically the data that uh, we normally deal with. <clears throat> and uh, uh, for, for this mock data, we used a series of n body snapshots from cell consistent in body simulations of bar galaxies at different stages of bar formation and, uh, and creating the images that resemble the real data uh, and in the sense of uh, having the velocity, uh, velocity dispersion maps, and then high order gas rate moments on the H3 and H4 here. And uh, using this uh, partial modeling approach, we tried to construct models for different properties of the potential here basically the overall normalization, overall mass of the galaxy, or expressed alternatively as the mass to light ratio, and uh, the pattern speed. So in the simplest case, there are only two free parameters, the pattern speed on the horizontal axis, the mass of the galaxy on the vertical axis. And since we do it for the simulated data, we know what is the true pro property of the model. So in principle, we could uh, Instead of trying to deproject the image, we can put in the correct three-dimensional shape of the galaxy. And that is uh, what is shown on the left. In the case that we know the three true three-dimensional density of the model, we are able to recover both uh, parameters, the pattern speed and the mass, very well. So the best fit model lies very close to truth. And the contours are very tight, uh, contours of delta chi square. Uh, but even in if we don't know the three-dimensional shape, but we try to infer it from the projected image. So this is the, uh, this plot showing the deprojected partially models for deprojected density models. There have larger uncertainties for the pattern speed and so for the mass, but so overall they're also not too far from truth. So the pattern speed is recovered to within 10, 20%. And I remind you that this is for the orientation that is exactly edge on. And in this case, the three-main environment method cannot be applied at all because uh, basically both integrals, numerator and denominator, cancel out to zero. So in this case, we're using a more sophisticated approach, which not only uses the mean velocity, but also uses the velocity dispersions and the, the shape of the velocity profile using the higher order Gaussian rate moments. There is enough information in these data to constrain the pattern speed relatively well. And uh, we also can constrain the orientation because uh, uh, I remind you that from photometry alone, we only can constrain it from above. But uh, from photometry, there is like all the models with uh, all of these orientations are equally probable. But while well, adding kinematics, now we have a more well-defined minimum for the orientation. So there is still some wiggle room, but uh, it's much better measured when you add kinematics. So that is a, a good sign. Now we can say that, yes, adding dynamical information, uh, adding kinematic information and using dynamical models as, as opposed to just purely kinematic models uh, helps you to constrain the properties of the bars much better. And uh, mm, I haven't mentioned so far the interplay between the bars and the black holes. But uh, uh, for one thing, black holes are also widespread in galaxies. And, expected that the majority of galaxies of at least Milky Way size will have supermassive black holes in the centers. And uh, measuring their masses is often done using uh, stellar dynamics. However, you could see that uh, uh, the bars here can pose a problem because, for example, if you see the bar exactly uh, 
kind of down the barrel, the stars travel along the line of sight and they have higher velocity dispersion, which you might mistake for a black hole. So uh, if you ignore the presence of the bar, uh, you might bias the inference of the black hole mass measurements. And uh, also it has been known that uh, since uh, early work in and of 90s, uh, early 2000s, that a very massive uh, central mass concentration, whether it's a black hole or a nuclear star cluster, actually induces some chaos into the uh, orbits of stars and it should destroy the bar. However, it turns out that the life is uh, more complicated and that only happens when you just put it there by hand. But uh, if it grows kind of organically, uh, starting from a small mass and then gradually accumulating mass, as it happens for real black holes in the universe, it actually might even strengthen the bar rather than weaken it. Um, that's uh, uh, another topic, but uh, uh, just to mention that bars in principle are not incompatible with black holes. So if in this series of models uh, that I just described, we add a third parameter, which is the mass of the black hole, how well can we constrain it? Not so well, but at least uh, there were some constraints. The thing is that even in these simulations, where we perfectly know the truth, the black hole is still, let's say, 0.1% of the galaxy mass. This happens to be in stereal galaxies. So in order to measure its mass, you really need the kinematics of stars very close to the central region, uh, where you might have some, in, rea in reality, you might have adaptive optic observations of just a small region around uh, the center, which we added here as a second component in the uh, simulated uh, photo, uh, simulated kinematic data set. Um, but uh, even then, the constraints on the black hole mass were not very tight, but at least they were not too far off. Um, but uh, that uh, was just a ver very first test, and uh, we are now doing a more sophisticated test of all. Basically, the first test indicates that we were able to put an upper limit on the black hole mass, but we are not able to constrain from below. At least the upper limit was not too far from the true value, so maybe a factor of two or three larger. Um, and uh, uh, I also mentioned that um, the approach based on the Schwarzschild's or orbit, orbit superposition method applied to uh, barred galaxies has been developed uh, recently by another group. And then, uh, they uh, started off the track cell dynamical modeling code uh, um, originally developed by Van den Bos and uh, more recently. Uh, revived and uh, um, sort of put into a proper usable shape by um, people in Vienna. It's called Dynamite. And uh, Bezat, Tamas Abzadeh, uh, who was a student of uh, Ling Zhu in Shanghai, developed an extension of the code for uh, working with bars, so adding a pattern speed to the code. And uh, they took a different approach to the uh, problem with the projection. Um, whereas in our case, we try to forward model it by having a boxy three-dimensional shape projected at different orientations and comparing it to photometry. Uh, they were relying on the uh, more traditional way of uh, fitting a surface density of ellipsoids using a multi-Gaussian expansion, but uh, uh, adding the second component of the bar separately. So the idea here is that the large scale uh, properties of the disk when you exclude the central region of the bar. It tells you about the orientation of the disk and about the inclination. So when you fit an uh, MG image to the large scale disk, excluding this region, gives you the property of the disk, then you fit the remaining light with another MG at a different orientation. And then you project it assuming the bar is ellipsoidal. As I told you, that's not quite the case, but it turns out that for dynamical modeling, it's not too bad. So they've conducted tests on uh, mock data, which illustrated that even though the uh, shape of the bar in the Schwarzschild model was not ellipsoidal, but uh, they, that fact did not bias much the inferred properties of the potential and the pattern speed. And they applied it to the real galaxy here, not just the simulated data, but the real galaxy, uh, which had the kinematic data from uh, Timer uh, survey uh, based on news and Atlas 3D and earlier surveys, uh, the more central region, and measured the pattern speed and, and properties of bar, at least based on two kinematic data sets, it was quite compatible. So, that's uh, to my knowledge, this is the first application and the only application so far of the Schwarzschild method to real data. 
but uh, uh, Beza now moved to uh, work uh, with Monica Valori. So hopefully, maybe a year or two, we should be able to, first of all, test how both Schwarzschild methods, dynamite and force time, the one they call the tight valve, how do they perform against each other, having different assumptions about the, uh, the projection of the system, and uh, applied to more real galaxies to actually measure the pattern speed finally for a larger set of galaxies. And uh, uh, with that, I conclude uh, my summary is very simple. The uh, modeling of the bar starts with the uh, question of how the three-dimensional density looks like. And that problem alone is already quite degenerate. Um, we have developed a me method for fitting these three-dimensional shapes of bars, including the X-shaped features using infits, but there are still some degeneracy when, when you just use the photometry. Um, but then we have when you add the kinematic information um, and apply one of the most sophisticated versions of uh, Schwarzschild modeling codes, then yeah, you can recover the properties of the system reasonably well. Um, the pattern speed and the stellar mass and even maybe putting some constraints on the black hole mass. So in summary, this is a mess, but at least there is a hope of getting the, some useful information out of it. So to illustrate it, here I put a, uh, a plot, uh, an image painting that I saw in Athens when I was there last time, and hopefully it will come again at some point to enjoy it even more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Eugene, for the very interesting talk and the very, very nice presentation and all the information that you gave us. Uh, it is time for some more questions. Let me see here. Well, uh, let me let me first ask you something. So uh, if we construct a Schwarzschild model, any kind, then uh, we have a, a consistency between the potential and the orbits that we use. And then if we just take this potential and we evolve that in time, then mm -hmm. it should stay there. Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm wondering, I have an, an example actually, well published, I don't remember how many years ago, but it, it is, I've never tried to, to see that. Uh, uh, it is in the 2D approximation, so it is easy to, uh, to, to visualize that. So it was in a case that uh, uh, by changing the pattern speed of a potential that we estimated from near infrared observations, mm -hmm. Seeing that the shape of the uh, uh, effective iso potentials were changing considerably, so there was not the 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 the, the, the image that we had uh, some uh, scaling, let's say, of uh, elliptical shapes in the iso potentials, but in a range of uh, of the parameters, then mm -hmm. some uh, answer type uh, potentials, and then in that case. It was uh, uh, obvious that if we had uh, any kind of uh, particles in uh, chaotic motion in that uh, in these uh, energy levels, then they wouldn't go out of that energy level, and then finally they would shape the observed uh, shape, the observed shape of the bar. So I'm wondering. Uh, if we should, uh, if it is uh, uh, something that can be observed in several galaxies, and if actually the, the the role of the chaotic orbits in that respect, in that context, should be uh, emphasized, maybe one should try with 3D distributions, with 3D models, mm -hmm. to have some shapes of ice or potential surfaces that predefine a shape. If we can have this kind of then, then uh, from the mathematical point of view, of course, it's uh, very easy to have a self-consistent uh, model because any kind of orbits, chaotic orbits you put in there, they will fill the, the, the volume and they will have the shape. But then, of course, we should uh, check uh, with uh, kinematics, etc. But I think it is a, a line that should uh, have some uh, more attention to see if there can be cases like that. What would you comment on that? Yeah, I think uh, you know, when you have chaotic orbits, uh, things do get really complicated because, yes, indeed, you don't have a fully uh, time and 
Well, the, the case you have shown before from the this from the PhD of my friend Dave Kaufman, which yeah. is they had they have found very nice ob, uh, orbits, and then the the self consistent test uh -huh. Uh -huh. gives the results we have right now. But what I'm saying is that look, the, this uh, galaxy, whatever it is, thirty nine ninety two, whatever, mm -hmm. such a type morphology. If the isopotential was shaping the uh, the uh, the structure we observe, then you could use, if you have, of course, but you can increase the amplitude, etc. Uh, chaotic orbits in that energy level, and just let in the gram then in time. The more, mm -hmm. you get, the better you will uh, have a, a rather homogeneous, at least uh, at the end. Ultimately, it will be uh, equal density everywhere. But the shape is there. That's mm -hmm. why I'm, I'm thinking that. Could we have these cases in bars and uh, well, and try to disentangle if it is the case uh, of chaotic or other objects from, from the kinematics? But since it is just something that's very mathematically straightforward, I, I think it would be worth the try. Just uh, this one. I have more questions, Alex, but let me see if there, is there anyone who wants to ask something. Just raise the hand or just speak because here. Okay, I don't see, see something else. Okay, then let me ask one more question. Uh, if uh, the question is if we can have uh, for the same, let's say, galaxy two solutions that could be self consistent with a Schwarzschild model, etc. Uh, could we have uh, this kind of cases where we could use different families of orbits? Okay, there will be, mm -hmm. of course, but finally, they will have, they will be both of them self consistent models distributing a, at least a similar density profile or whatever mm -hmm. criteria. What yeah. Would... Yes, uh, when you only have density, you want to reproduce a given density, and there is a large variety because in the Schwarzschild methods, in general, the number of free parameters, the number of orbits is much larger than the number of constraints. Uh, so the problem is underdetermined. As I said, it's not just a linear programming problem. You have to put in the conditions that the weights are non-negative, but even then, in principle, the matrix is much, kind of much wider than taller. So uh, you have a lot of non-uniqueness in the solution for the density alone. Yeah. When you add kinematic information, that uh, degeneracy is lifted to a larger extent. I think there is still uh, not entirely clear how much uh, th does the addition of kinematics pinpoint it to just one solution, or there is still a range of solutions that are perfectly compatible with the, both the density and the given kinematic coverage. It seems that if the kinematics is limited to a relatively small region on the sky, even as small as, uh, let's say, here, right? Well, it's not particularly small, but it's not the whole galaxy either. Um, you might rearrange the orbits in the outer part, which is which are not directly observed by your IFU, in such a way as to have somewhat different uh, density outside, but uh, conspire then to have the same kinematics in the inner part. And um, if you increase the coverage, the this degeneracy becomes smaller and smaller. But uh, I don't know that I don't know if there is any uh, firm result that in practice you would not have these problems. However, it's interesting though that uh, uh, I think that I haven't mentioned, but I, it's interesting that in principle uh, the self consistency alone, the fact that you need to reproduce the shape of uh, the potential gives you quite strong constraints in the pattern spin. That's why these earlier methods, which are kind of pure response models, they're not uh, adjusting the orbit weights or anything. They're just putting orbits and seeing how the morphology looks like. Uh, they're simpler, but they're able to constrain the properties of the bar because if you put the wrong pattern speed, you will not get the right shape of the bar. And we also have see we also see it in Schwarzschild models. That's uh, if the pattern speed is wrong, then you're not able to reproduce the density. And no matter how you re rearrange the orbits, they are not able to reproduce the features of the bar, like this ANSI and the vertical X shape and so on. So 
to some extent, uh, the density alone gives you some information about the pattern speed, but of course, adding kinematics gives you much more information. Sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, actually, uh, the, the question that I think in the last years is uh, uh, raised by several groups is uh, if uh, the general idea that we have that uh, the orbits in that uh, support the bars are uh, following the rules of the dy general dynamics uh, dynamical systems, namely that the simplest the the orbit, let's say an ellipse, etc., a simple ellipse is this kind of solutions that we have to uh, uh, to accept to try to construct uh, the bar. This is it. Uh, what we have to follow, or more complicated shapes that are orbits of higher multiplicity of whatever, and then they can do the same. So I think that what we discussed is in this direction. Mm -hmm, I see mm -hmm. more questions here from Haris Tsakonas. Haris, uh, go, please go on. Hello, uh, very nice talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so my question is on the work that you've done to calculate the pattern speed, you, the slide you showed before. So you had some mock data. You mm -hmm. had, uh, so we reproduced a field of view of news. Uh, so you had some mock data. Mm -hmm. My question is, how complicated was the morphology of the bar that you used as mock data? So was it like a next shape bar? But I mean, you you said that you, in a sense, you knew the answer, and you, then you implemented your method to see if you if your method would converge to the same answer. Yeah, and it, it did. I mean, you see, you. You had a good agreement, but how how complicated was the structure of, of the bar that you had in your mock data? Uh, yeah, well, this is, I think, uh, this snapshot from the same simulation, or at least uh, one of the simulations that went into these mock tests. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As you could see, it there is, it's not very complicated. It, the bar, it's mostly bar only. There is some hints of spiral arms, but they're not very prominent, and you ignore them in the models. The bar has... Mm, typical structure of like a central vertically thicker part and then ANSE with a slightly uh, protruding slightly further out uh, but thinner vertically and uh, the recovered model didn't match it in all details you could see that it doesn't have this uh, um, kind of uh, well it, it's more more ellipsoidal in in this direction because this is the direction along which you integrate you don't have explicit mm -hmm. information about it in your line of sight because uh, you're integrating the lo along the line of sight. But uh, the main features like uh, the X shape and the uh, thickness are well reproduced. So uh, it's not a perfect match, but uh, it seems that uh, even with the imperfect match, the addition of dynamical constraints helps you to recover the properties of the bar. Not as good as if you knew the density perfectly, but not to, not much worse. Okay. okay, thank you. So let me check if there are more questions. I don't think so. It, uh, uh, Eugene, thank you very much again. It, it was really very, we can stay here for a long time discussing, but I think we have to stop at least the recording part of the uh, of the talk and let's hope that we meet soon again to continue the discussion. Many, many thanks uh, for, for your talk. It was really very interesting and will be online. So everybody who wants to get in there and uh, uh, see again the slides, etc., of course, we'll have the opportunity. So thank, thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Yep. I can stay longer if you want to discuss a, any particular features as well. Yeah. Uh, let me uh, don't, don't log uh, don't log out, but let mm -hmm. me. I don't.